So I'm going to present is uh, something that I have been involved in at uh, University College for the past couple of years, uh, and that uh, has an earlier history. So it, it turns out that the, when the crisis hits and uh, uh, the proverbial shield hits the fan, uh, then one of the uh, potential victims of the crisis was the economics profession as a whole. People started saying, you know, economists, you're idiots, you didn't, you know, didn't know what was coming. And as part of that, uh, I think part of it was deserved, but, but as, as part of that, there was some initiative by a bunch of uh, students and then also academics on let's try to reform the way we teach to make it more relevant and so on. Um, and it, and the, the teaching committee of the, of the Royal Economic Society had entrusted when my colleague Wendy Carlin for trying to do something about it. Uh, so she started working on this, and news of the work that was started to be done appeared in the, in the FT and in The Economist. And one day over lunch, I said, wow, Wendy, this sounds interesting. You know, what is it about? And she said, you want to help? And I have a terrible uh, tragedy that I, I have a difficulty saying no, so I started uh, helping out. And what I'm going to tell today is sort of what we were doing because this is uh, like the core project approach. And one of the important things about the core project approach is that it's a collective approach. So a bunch of people uh, get together from all over the place, and they started collaborating and trying to do something slightly different. Now, this is different in many dimensions. That's, that's part of what uh, I wanted to emphasize. And one of the things that, that is different is we, we want to try to use technology uh, in order to, to help us make things better. And the particular technology I'm, I'm using in, in class, I don't think everyone in the core project is using this one, but I, this is one that I find useful, is this uh, software called Lecture Tools uh, that integrates the possibility of uh, just doing a standard presentation with feedback from the students. Um, so there are several layers of feedback, uh, and you can see from here, for example, there's this uh, dashboard, and there's this, this, you know, things in here, for example. Uh, students can raise the flag, so this, this thing that is here is, uh, students can enter the system, the lecture tool system, which is integrated with the Moodle platform, and when they find a, one of the transparencies or the explanation of transparency confusing, they can flag it. And I can see the number. This zero means there might be 20, 30, zero, one people that say, I find this transparency confusing. Now, if you found this transparency confusing, then that would be a problem. No, normally, the first transparency, there are no, no confusions. Um, the second place that the second thing they can do is they can actually ask questions while I'm there. So one difficulty I always find, at least in a I teach in a lecture room that is about this size. We have 100, 340 students, and even in a smaller classroom, when I was in Spain, I had the normal trouble getting some people to, to raise their hands and ask a question. So normally there would be uh, someone, typically a, a, a male, sitting in the, in the first row that was asking you know, 10 questions a class, and no one else would ask a question. When I was hoping people to ask, nobody asked. Now, the one advantage of this system is that, is that they ask a question and they, they input it in there. They don't have to raise their hands or do anything. Uh, for shy students, that is a bonus, and then that's useful. And then uh, when I start seeing several questions appearing, then I can open this and I can preview the questions. In fact, everyone can see the questions, and, and I, I can uh, use this to answer. So, so that's one first piece of innovation. is part of the software with which I present. Like, not everyone uses it, but I think it's useful. Uh, lecture tools uh, is not free, uh, except that I think if you have less than 20, 30 students, it's free. So for those of you that have small groups, I think you can probably use it for free. Anyway, uh, I was saying that uh, part of the, uh, the uh, core approach is, is multi-pronged. So we don't we do just let's make the text more relevant, or let's make the course more relevant. We do several things at the same time. So first, and probably most importantly, uh, is content. Now, if you've read the FT or the Economist pieces and you've heard about the project, you might think that this is all about uh, inequality and we are doing the Piketty version of the standard micro textbook. But, but uh, I, I, 
I was very much against this from the beginning, so although there is a lot about inequality, which is, I think, good and healthy, and it, it was uh, about time, uh, I think that the, there is a concept change in the way we teach at least the micro, uh, and I will, I will talk ab about a bit more about this a, a bit later, but the, the main thing is there's a shift from a very relatively old uh, Paul Simonson general equilibrium style, which even now is, is the way you teach, uh, let's say, MANQ, uh, to a more modern kind of mechanism design style. I'll be more precise about this, but there's, there is a difference. So there's, we did change the concept. Rather than just take an old and, and fit uh, new pieces here and there, which is the, the, the traditional approach is take the content, the standard content, when some new topic arises, then you add one more chapter and, you know, network externalities, one chapter on network externalities, uh, game theory, a chapter on game theory. You redesign the course with a different perspective. So that's one, uh, I think, important novelty. You might not agree, but, but uh, this is a, a blueprint, let's say, of how one, one could do innovation. Let's try to rethink the whole content rather than add chapters. Um, the second important innovation uh, that we do is, rather than, than this being the star lecturer of Harvard or Cambridge or UCLA. Uh, and this is a bunch of people from all over the place, and not necessarily some not even from uh, particularly distinguished institutions. I think that uh, that is an asset um, for at least. I think it worked for us. Now, another important uh, dimension, given the kind of collectivist approach to this, is that also the revisions are sort of collective. So there's a bunch of people who wrote the first version. It was adopted in you know, a couple dozen universities around the globe. And we got feedback from the lecturers that taught it, but also from independent, let's say, referees that were uh, seeing both the material and how it was taught in different places. So that's sort of novel, again, uh, in this thing. Uh, now, the, another really important issue, uh, now this is not the order in which I wrote it, but uh, Wendy wanted to have core in there, so, so evaluation is there, although I think it should be the last thing, is the typical way one, one, does, uh, one does evaluation, and this is the, the part that is still more uh, in process, and, and where I would welcome very much your, your comments either now or, or maybe later if you want to email me, is uh, when you evaluate a course, then you give a survey to the students and you ask them whether they are happy. And okay, that's fine, uh, but we would like to do something different. And the different diff there refers to the nature of the way we, we can do the evaluation. Ideally, of course, we would want to do some kind of randomized control trial, and uh, that turns out to be very hard, but something we can do is do uh, baselines uh, of kind of outcomes and knowledge and, you know, variety of things uh, for individuals in adopting and not adopting institutions. And then after uh, the course, and in some cases even after adoption, we can see how they did. And that provides a basis for some kind of evaluation, imperfect as, as that may be, uh, of the impact of the course. Uh, innovation, again, in the way the textbook is presented from being uh, very expensive. Uh, I think MANQ now in the US cost on the order of 250 bucks uh, to, uh, and mostly offline. So there is a book maybe with some supporting material online. Uh, here it will be free for, for users. Of course, it's not free. Nada is gratis. Uh, so it's not free uh, because there is effort in there, but the users won't have to pay something for it. Uh, it will be mostly online and, and very interactive compared to the standard textbook. And then the, the final sort of uh, innovation I mentioned here is in the classroom. So students have to uh, read because before they come to the class, interact with the, with the text. And in, in what, when they come to class, we try to give them mostly new stuff, stuff that is not there uh, in, the, in the text. Uh, and and they interact some more. And you'll see some examples of this as we go along. OK, so that's sort of the, the summary. Um, let me give you, for example, you know, this is an example. Now, the motivation for, for doing this, is, or for the initial motivation for doing this, as I, as I discussed, is that, is that we thought, or many people thought, that economists were not 
doing in class the answers to the question that people wanted to be answered in an economics class. So people that do economics, or at least some of the people that do economics, do it because they really want to understand the world, and we were just not providing the answers. So one first thing, and this gives you an example of how, how the, the co in, the, in the course you would interact, is you get this question. What do you think is the most important question economics should address? Uh, and then if you were there in class, you can type your response directly into lecture tools. So you would have access Moodle and you would answer this in class. In fact, even now, you could, uh, you could answer. Now, the, the problem is that, that I, I'm, I have a lecture tools account based in the UK, so you have to send in a text to an uh, English phone number, so I don't think you will do it, but, but that's the kind of thing that we were asking. So we'll be doing an polling uh, that starts the polling, and then we would finish the polling, uh, and then we would print the results. Now, since there's... No one has answered, there are zero responses, so there's nothing to see. But here in class, you would see the different answers of different people. For a question like this that is free form, we just see a list. Numerical questions, you would see distributions and, and so on. So that's, uh, that's sort of what uh, one would see here. Okay. Now, as I said, the part of the impetus for the course is that, is that we were not listening, so the economists were just doing what we thought was right, but we were not trying to see what the people coming to class wanted to answer. And this is an example. So I, last year in, in, in UCL, we did this uh, kind of video show when we started making photographs and students responded and we uh, uh, saw photos. So that's one of my students from last year. But uh, in, in Bogota, uh, also last year, they, we, they, they asked them, and this is a list of some of the answers. What is it that students want to understand? How do different countries manage the economy? How can we understand what is the best economic model? How to bring psychology to economics? Why do big banks fail? How does history affect the economy? This is sort of a list of things. And, and this list of things became part of, of the bank of questions that, that we sort of put into the designers of the text when they were writing, so that they were kept in mind. Uh, and now, given all this question, uh, the initial motivation, in fact, the first two units has to do with what's potentially the most striking factor. This is one of the, the fact that we find the most striking about the economic evolution over the last uh, kind of millennia. So you can see that uh, these are living standards in five, country, five different countries from year to 1000 to 2010, and this is from the, you know, all the great work that the economic historians have done over the last uh, 50 years, trying to see how standards of living have evolved, and you see that basically nothing is going on for lots of countries until basically a couple hundred years ago, and sort of miraculously, seems, uh, things start changing really very fast and, and have dramatically changed the way, the way we live uh, in the world. And that's really a very important question. That's how we start, uh, that's how we start the book. Uh, now, a bit more in detail. So we start, and that's sort of a blueprint of what is doing. We start with a big question. So the, what's a big question? Uh, and, and it's this hockey stick, this change in, in living standards. Uh, what's the baby answer that one gives? Already in chapter one and two, immediately we give some tentative answers. Well, the, the big change has to do uh, with, uh, with technology. Technology has become immensely better and has been put to use. Now, that's kind of part of the answer that we give. The other part of the answer is, why is that technology changing at precisely that time, and why do we think uh, that that it did, need not happen? Or this, in fact, didn't happen in every way. It happened in some places and not others. And then part of the answer has to be with the institutions, with the rules of the game that people play with, how the interactions in the different societies were conducted and how that changed over time. So those are the, the, the elements of, of the motivation for doing what, what remains. And then this leads us to think uh, about, about a method to study this. So institutions are important. Why is it that important? How can we think about it? And the approach that we take, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, is, is what I call the, like a mechanism design approach. We could organize societies in very different ways. Uh, we just locked into one way of organizing society that seems to work to produce this change. So since that's the, the way we are going to propose the, 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 the explanation for what goes on, then we're going to give 
the, all the elements for the explanation from the beginning. So unlike the usual textbook where you just say, okay, we live in a society full of markets, let's understand markets, let's understand them from the beginning, that's how people make decisions in markets, first we describe the producers, the consumers, we aggregate them, general equilibrium, so that's the standard way. We say, no, no, let's backtrack from this, because societies are now organized in markets, they could be organized in other ways, so let's think of this, and that's why I call this like a mechanism design approach. Now, in order to do this, we need to do some of the same things that we do in the standard class. Of course, uh, in any decision problem, so institutions come from decisions of individuals. So first of all, we need to understand how people make decisions. So that's why in Unit 3, we have limits of choice, decision theory, uh, kind of budget sets, uh, constraints. So basically, uh, Unit 3 would be about constraint optimization, people making choices when they have limits. Now, Unit 4 already says, okay, but wait a second, we are t going to talk about institutions. So if we talk about institutions, we have to realize that the decisions that people make are interacting with the decisions of other people at the same time. So that's why Unit 4 already understands the limits of choice, the others, so games, norms, even reciprocal altruism, because we want to expand the range of models that are explained. So it will not be all... Uh, homo economicus, we know that homo economicus is only part of how people behave, so we will then understand some other things at the same time. So now we have the basis, we know how people make decisions, we know that these decisions interact, so there's a little bit of game theory involved. And now unit three, since we want to, thought, to think about institutions, we say, but this interaction doesn't, is not something exogenous that is important to you. The rules of the game that people play are also, in a sense, rules that we endowed with ourselves socially, so we want to understand uh, how uh, the people interact. So this is, all of this is babies, baby decision theory, baby game theory, baby mechanism design. So some elements so that people understand uh, how, they are, how they are going to, to go about this. Now once all of this is put into place, now we have the elements to try to answer a bit more the big questions. And then we start uh, with uh, different markets and how different institutional arrangements in different markets work. So we started with the labor institutions and different outcomes for different labor institutions. Uh, then we go with the firm operating alone in a monopoly. And, and why we start with a monopoly? Because since this is a mechanism design, we could start anywhere. Let's just start with a firm working alone. That gives you a little bit how firms make choices when they're alone. Then one introduces competition so that then we can start talking about markets. Uh, and then once we've understood you know, how this particular institution works, then they say, okay, let, let's change the rules in the markets, and then we can even start thinking about dynamics, baby dynamics again, bubbles and crashes, and then finally we can say, okay, uh, yeah, some of the standard external effects in market failure. So that's the sort of approach. Now, this might be the wrong approach, but all I'm saying is that, is that we took, a, you know, rather than taking tradition and modifying it a little bit, we, we started from scratch in the design. Uh, phase. Unit four, uh, like I said, wants to explain a social dilemma. We talk about the, the, the motivation for this is there's all these things that are going on that we know uh, temperature is rapidly rising. We know that there is a relationship with, uh, with uh, uh, carbon emissions and this is terrible. That's the motivation. You know, it's, it's the action of human that says maybe we are crazy and we try to say, wait a second, Craziness is the last explanation that we want to use. Let's try to, to use some more uh, reasonable explanation. And then that allows us to introduce a uh, prisoner's dilemma. Uh, of course, you all know what a prisoner's dilemma is, but this is, these are first year students, they don't know what it is. And then we explain first baby prisoner dilemma with only two people, then we explain prisoner dilemma with more people, uh, and you see why this could be an explanation. Now, if we, if we were in lecture tools, I would now show you what's the, the, standard, the standard way that, that, that we also show them with an experiment how we, we test it, but we also, within the, 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 uh, the example, say, but wait a second, uh, we, we can't get pessimistic here, but we also know from the evidence, from the experimental evidence, for example, is that, is that uh, our internal motivations make us cooperative a little bit, and, and you can see that this is in a public good experiment, people start cooperating. We also start see that uh, cooperation goes down over time, and we, 
we see that, that one can change the amount of, uh, of cooperation by changing the rules of the game, which is also part of the, of the, uh, of the story here. So by introducing punishment, in fact, altruistic punishment opportunities, you can make cooperation go back up, and this gives you lessons about you don't have to lose hope, you just have to understand how people behave, and that gives you tools to at least try to change uh, a game that you think is going badly. Okay, so now that sort of is a nutshell what we're trying to do in terms of content and so on. And, and then uh, the pro the, we also said that we innovate in the pro uh, production process and the revision. So the, the first uh, beta uh, version of the, of the core uh, was done by about you know, a bit more than two dozen academics from around the world that participated in writing 21 units. So I, uh, together uh, with uh, someone else, we were doing unit four, the one on game theory, and a bunch of experts on different areas did different units. And then uh, basically Wendy Carlin and Sam Bowles went over the whole manuscript and, and tried to homogenize it so that it had a kind of common flow. We also participated in this process in, in the homogenization so that, so that there was sort of smooth. But, but this, this was a, a big effort, but I think it, it paid off. Um, so, that's, so after the course is first tested, like at UCL, uh, this is at uh, Paris Sciences Po, uh, and where is this? Uh, I think this might be in, in Santiago de Chile. Uh, then after this is done, then we go to the, to the process in which students get feedback. So we get you know, uh, feedback over time from the students, from the te teachers that are teaching the course, and then from some experts. So for example, uh, Christian Golia and Nick Stern uh, gave uh, feedback on Unit 18, which is on climate change, uh, Phil Blaine on Unit 16, uh, you know, Afton uh, Barry Eichengreen in units 2 and 17, Tony Atkinson 19, so on. And there were workshops where we presented this. I think that's uh, the workshop in Santiago de Chile in uh, November 2014, so that we could come together and, and discuss it. Uh, and that led to revisions. There will be a further revision. The first kind of fully authorized revision of the ebook is uh, appears in autumn 2017, but there will have been three or four previous ones. Uh, this. Now, in addition, there's some ancillary material like uh, teach, how to teach guides, slides for anyone that can use it from that have been used in various places, multiple choice questions, problems, games, simulations, and so on. Um, there will be a how to teach workshop in collaboration with the Economics Network and the International Economics Association. I think it's happening today or tomorrow in, in uh, some place in India. Okay, so you can register and download for free the units and you can uh, interact with them online, of course. Now the textbook, as I've said, has uh, many things uh, in there. Uh, so you have uh, the ebook but you can download the PDFs of the units. Uh, you also have what we call Leibniz supplements. So one of the interesting things by teaching this in many different areas is that students have different expectations and needs. So for example, the UCL students uh, get annoyed if they don't get derivatives and integrals. So, so they, they are all, I mean, they are all self-selected into coming to UCL. They, Everyone has to have a, what we call an A star, which is uh, made equivalent to a 10 in, in the, the marks in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in mathematics in Spain. So they are all very, very, very math oriented. So in order to keep their within their comfort zone, we throw to them you know, a lot of you know, calculus, so that's fine. Uh, so what, this can be taught at very different levels, and that's one of the, the, of the beauties. Um, and then, but then, of course, the text is, is, very, uh, is very kind of graphic, intensive, and interactive. And all these graphs move around. It's kind of a delight to watch. Uh, the, the team that produce all these graphs in, in Bangalore are really first rate. Uh, so that's the, the Shapiro Stiglitz uh, graphical version of the, of the model. Uh, it's very good. Uh, like I said, there are calculus supplements with, uh, with that relates the, the things that we do with uh, graphs, with uh, all the necessary calculus things. Uh, uh, and then you also provide data. So there are, there are data for many of the units that 
uh, people can play with and kind of do graphs or do even mini regressions if they want, if they're sufficiently good. So it's a bunch of things that can be done. Um, in classroom, and, and I realize I'm running out of time, one part of what we do, I, don't, I won't spend too much time on this because I think Umberto is going to talk about this, but we do uh, experiments almost in every unit, one or two, uh, and, and this is uh, the, the voluntary contributions public good experiment that, that, that I do in class. Uh, and then they, of course, they immediately get the response. This is the response with the slightly older technology that I was using last year, which is Turning Point. Uh, but you know, this year I used. Uh, but they, they, they realized that some people. This is actually the responses I got in class. So, uh, 25 were Homo economicus, 34 were Homo whatever altruistic, and a bunch of people were confused like here in the middle. Um, and I also did uh, a, a bit more a complicated experiment on uh, King Solomon's dilemma. So I did King Solomon, explained what King Solomon's dilemma is uh, in class, and I gave the first uh, solution, which is just you know give the baby to you know one of the two mothers, then uh, do a baby game that is not very uh, very good, uh, and that and that's the good that. Um, that's the game that is proposed in the in the Bible. Although in the Bible, you know, then then the king cheats, but because he says that if you both insist on wanting the boy, you know, the general will cut the boy in half, and and that's a payoff matrix sort of for for this thing. And then and then I go to the to the kind of uh, more interesting things that people like uh, our next uh, president Rafa has you know has done uh, in his life and. And then I do an experiment on, on an auction of a boy, which uh, kind of created some uh, people to be annoyed at the economist. But then I explained that this is all uh, a metaphor. Um, and then the, the final frontier, of course, is evaluation. Um, for now, like I said, what, I, what we're trying to do is baseline MCQs, ad adopters and not adopters, and then end of, end of course MCQs. This is a sort of diff in diff, so that we can see the impact. Uh, this kind of methodology, by the way, has been used uh, in the past, uh, sort of experimentally. The one experiment that I know that has been run, I think, in Zurich and Chile, uh, uh, was that doing um, uh, dictator game experiments in, uh, before the students that are entering the classes in economics, law, chemistry, I think, so two or three disciplines at the beginning of the, of the year, and then after two years of being exposed to, to economics and chemistry and law. Uh, and it turns out that in Zurich, uh, the, the, students, uh, the students of economics are more uh, selfish than the students in the, other, in the other disciplines, but studying economics don't make them even more selfish. They just have no impact. We have no impact. Um, um, whereas I think in Chile, again, economic students are more selfish, and the, the teaching of uh, economics in Chile makes them more selfish. Uh, so it, this has been used before. It's obviously not perfect, and uh, if anyone is interested in an RCT, which is typically not possible in Anglo universities, where many lectures are like this, so there's no way to split the, the people, but maybe elsewhere, in general, it's far from perfect for the reasons that I say. It's impossible to check the common trends assumption. It's hard to untangle teacher from method effects, which perhaps is not a problem. One would expect people to self-select into the best method for teaching that they can have. But anyway, uh, here I'm really, really interested in uh, uh, doing this in front of this many people gives me a chance to, to advertise. So if anyone has ideas or even suggestions, uh, then, then that would be great. And there's a bunch of things coming up in the next years, but uh, for the time being, we're trying to turn a tanker uh, using a coordinated approach. And my conjecture uh, is, that, is that all this coordinated and complicated effort is what it takes to turn you know, a tanker. So uh, I first learned um, economics in, in the 1980s using the Samuelson textbook that my father had used in the 1950s. And I had the, you know, the maximum grades in my introductory economics class in the 1980s with a book that was 30 years old. I bet you 
that if I take the, you know, someone should move from the library and give it to a, a student in a standard uh, university nowadays, this 60 year old book is also going to allow him to get per almost perfect grades. At least for the micro part, not so sure for the macro. But anyway, th the point is, it's not easy to change this. Some of it is for good reasons. Many of the content that we have is very similar, if not identical, to things that you see in Monkey. But I think the changing approach might be uh, useful and good. Uh, but of course, I don't know until someone tells me how to do an evaluation better than I propose. Thank you very much. <laughs>